let's talk about the stride model. Um, this, this is a way to, to model threats. Uh, if you're, this is not gonna be a deep dive into it. If you're already using it, that's fantastic. For those of you who are not using it, I want you to be aware that it exists and it's a model for identifying threats, okay? So when you are prioritizing features and designing extensions, enhancements to your software, um, think about, uh, and, and especially the people doing the testing of the software too, think about uh, the possibility, the ways that somebody would be able to spoof the identity of a user of the software. Think about the vectors, the, the surface area where it might be possible for someone to tamper with the data for repudiation, for information disclosure, for denial of service, or, or for elevation of privilege, okay? Now, uh, just do some internet search. If you've never heard of this model, do some internet searches, uh, read up on it, because there is so much low-hanging fruit in just asking the questions on these, on these six different areas. Hmm, how would somebody try to do this in this area? How would they try to spoof? How would they try to tamper? How would they try to deny service? You just There's value in asking the questions. There's a lot of low hanging fruit just by asking the questions um, and, and making sure that you've done everything, uh, everything reasonable to start with. You know, like repudiation, that's a weird word, but it's a, a user being able to deny performing of an action say I didn't do that um, you know a common challenge is digital signatures and being able to prove that a particular person made an approval or signed a document or, or executed a transaction and you know what if that person is able to say to do something but then later on come back and say well I didn't actually do that so that's repudiation all right so there's a lot of things here let's let's go up to the 30,000 foot model and say, okay, how do I integrate a lot of this into my process? Well, the DevOps environment is kind of guided by an overall 12 step process. And that's what you see here on the screen. The top four are things that we do to decide what changes to make in the software. The middle row is the actual act of changing code and getting ready a change in the software from typing code to getting to a new release candidate that's in Azure Artifacts. And then the bottom row is actually promoting a release candidate through real environments to the point where users are actually using it in production and we can see telemetry of them using it and how it's going in production. And so we take this and we flatten it out onto a Kanban style board. And every project tracking tool has the ability to have Kanban style boards. And, and so this is what I consider your very average kind of minimal or normal Kanban board with all the different columns where you see right in the middle of it development, whereas people are actually writing code and there's coding tasks and there's commits to the Git repository happening. The columns before it are some type of decision about what change are we going to make? And you know, the first one, you could rename it requirements gathering. Well, I, call, I like to call that conceptual definition just to be more specific, but I don't care what the column, what you name these columns, but get the gist of it here. Conceptual definition is what we're trying to accomplish. And then, we move on to user experience design, which is asking ourselves the question, how is a person actually going to use this new software capability? Even a batch job that just moves data in the background has a user experience because data being from point A to point B every five seconds is a very different user experience than data being from point A to point B every 24 hours and being in some system room, oh yeah, uh, that, that fresh data is gonna be here tomorrow, okay? So absolutely every change to the software has some type of user experience. It doesn't just always have to be with the eyeballs, but certainly um, storyboards and, and screen layouts would definitely be in that column. And then the next is technical design. That's where architectural decisions get made. That's where we, we, we look at the surface area of 
uh, of the packages that we're using and uh, think, do I need a new library for this? What are the patterns that I'm using in the code? Are there new architectural elements that are needed? And we take the, the features and, and, or whether you call them story cards or product backlog items or whatever they happen to be, and we start splitting them up into, into development tasks or smaller story cards that are individually workable um, so that a, a, a programmer can take one of the cards and implement it you know, within a day, within a half day, because we don't want someone to take a card and then work on it for days on end. We want to have bite-sized chunks since we split it up. Um, but then the last design column is test design. That's the definition of done. That's where acceptance tests get, get laid out. These are just test scenarios. And for any given change to the software's behavior, we should be able to figure out how we're going to test it. And these are just bullet point scenarios. These are not big test documents. These are just, you know, small four or five, even 10 word descriptions of a scenario that we're going to run it through. And so to, to integrate test thinking into this, you would have some test scenarios that explicitly uh, call for attempting to subvert or thwart or compromise data, things like that. Um, all right, let me go forward. So that's, that's how you lay out your process. And then of course, after development, it's a, it's a mirrored validation. We validate functionally, we validate on user experience and, and what we can see with our eyeballs. And then we validate the release. Are we actually ready to deploy to production? And that includes uh, visibility to telemetry and logs um, and scale and performance and things like that. Um, I want to start uh, kind of the last section on runtime and production with the with the OWASP top 10. Again, if you are already familiar and already making sure that this is incorporated in your process, fantastic. You're awesome. Um, if you are not using these in your current team, then go educate these, on, on, go educate yourself on what these are and just start using them. Again, it's not rocket science. I would say the 80-20 rule, 80% 80 of the benefit is, is just being aware that these are really common and that they have actually really common uh, solutions and, and risk mitigations as well. Uh, over the last four years, there has been some, uh, some movement in the priority of each one of these. Uh, at, at the same time, a lot of them are, were a top 10 in 2017, and they still are top. Actually, there's only three of them that just poked into the top 10 in 2021, and that's insecure design, uh, software and data integrity failures, and server-side request forgery. So um, if you look at uh, broken access control, that was, that was number five in 2017, it's now it's number one. Um, sensitive data exposure, it was number three, and now it's number two, but of course they renamed it to cryptographic failures. So some of them have been top 10 for a while. They just kind of are jockeying in different positions. So um, be aware of these, educate yourself and your team on these, and just evaluate your software for uh, these vulnerabilities and make sure you have a mitigation.